Hi, I'm Sue Glenn, and we're going to be talking about species abundance and diversity. And this is working at a community or ecosystem level of ecology as opposed to working at a population level. So we're talking about uh, uh, patterns of species richness and species diversity that we find across a landscape. And uh, I, I'm Using the basis of the lecture uh, from the textbook Ecology Concepts and Applications that was written or published in 2019 by Manuel Moles and Anna Scher. It's a, a McGraw Hill uh, textbook and uh, uh, working out of the eighth edition. So, uh, you know, different different places across an area will have uh, very different numbers of species uh, depending on the types of habitats and resources. And you can travel and go for driving and you'd be able to see uh, uh, actually uh, the dominant species could stay the same. But uh, if you went and walked into the woods, you would probably find that um, uh, there's quite a bit of variety when you're going into a wetland area versus up in an upland area or as the uh, soils change. So uh, we're going to be talking, uh, first talking about the, the number of different types of species, species richness. Some of the terminology as we're going through this uh, I concept, uh, we will be talking about community ecology and communities are, are uh, we're talking about the species, the biotic communities that are inhabiting a, a certain area. So we could be looking at uh, the plants and animals, uh, the invertebrates, the algae, um, and there's just a, all these species are interacting in different ways. And we've talked about some of these interactions before. So when you're doing that, you, you can be looking at uh, communities structure and how it affects the number of species and the relative abundance of each of those species and what kinds of species you find within the community. Um, but you know nobody is really an expert on all the different kinds of species. People usually focus on in on certain types of species. So um, even though the community structure would uh, include all the different kinds of species, uh, often you'll hear uh, people talk about a guild. And a guild is a group of organisms that all kind of do the same thing uh, in the in the uh, community. Uh, so you could have uh, somebody who's studying the seed eating animals in an area or the uh, all the birds that use old growth trees and, and like all the different woodpeckers and, and animals that are or even the mammals using the trees or you might have fruit eating birds in tropical rainforests or if you're looking at a stream you might be interested in the invertebrates that are filter feeding um, at the bottom of the stream, the benthic invertebrates. Uh, so they're usually um, closely related species, but sometimes uh, you might find a variety of, of different species uh, that are not closely related. So if I was looking at the things that were using old trees and the holes in old trees and the food in old trees, I might be talking about birds and mammals and insects. I might be looking at a variety of different species in that particular guild. Um, botanists don't use the term guild. Usually they usually use uh, some sort of life form system. Uh, you've seen me talk about uh, trees as a life form, shrubs as a life form, uh, grasses, uh, forbs, which are the plants that are in the grassland but are not the grasses. They're, they're uh, things like your dandelion in the lawn that will die back every winter but then um, uh, they'll be uh, re-sprouting, uh, but we've talked about annual plants as a as a life form. Uh, vines are a life form, so uh, we have ways of trying to sort of uh, focus in on a piece of all of this diversity because there, it is sometimes a little overwhelming how much there there is out there. We've talked about species abundance before, and uh, and so we we've kind of looked at. Uh, where we find uh, species uh, located and we've talked about uh, how they might be concentrated in higher populations in certain places and uh, uh, 
those are a really interesting paper, uh, well, a series of papers. Uh, there was a paper published in 1948 by Frank Preston, and then that was followed up by two um, really thorough papers in 1962 in ecology, where uh, he was looking at um, how when you're looking at uh, the number of individuals in or number of species there are in an area uh, there are some species that uh, are very very rare um, and then there are some species that are very very common but the most abundant group of species are ones that were somewhere in the middle an intermediate number of species and uh, so you you uh, will find very few rare ones and very few abundant ones. Well, you notice the abundant ones more, but uh, there might only be five or six of them as you're walking through the forest, and there might be five or six rare ones, but then the, the rest of the stuff you see in um, sort of an intermediate number. And uh, so Preston was looking at this relative abundance of species and uh, and uh, really was uh, describing the distribution of commonness and rarity and uh, was was really the first person to look at the structure of communities in this way. Preston used a log normal distribution in order to depict this relationship between abundance and uh, and the uh, number of species that we find with with the uh, different numbers of individuals and uh, so so uh, the way this works is if we look at, uh, this is data that he took from uh, Robert Whitaker. Uh, if you look at the uh, percent cover of different plant species, so, so the, this is the, the biomass or the amount of plants in that population. Um, and, uh, and you can see that these cover classes are uh, sort of the percent of the area covered by each species. And some species uh, were find, found with very high coverage and some species were found with very low coverage. But each category is double the one before that. So uh, it's a frequency distribution basically. And so uh, when we look at this, this change uh, from, from one point to the next point, that's uh, basically doubling the size of the population of going from this point to this point. We're going from a uh, population with percent cover of four to eight, and then uh, going from 32 to 64. So this is basically a base two a logarithm across the x-axis where each line is, is double the population of the line before that. And then up the y-axis, we just have species richness, the number of species that had that amount of cover. So very few species had uh, very high cover. Uh, so very few species were dominating the area. Very few rare species were found. Most of the species were somewhere in the middle. So most plant species had moderate coverage. It takes a bit to get your head around this log normal distribution. Um, spend some time, take a look at it. Try drawing one. So you should be able to explain what the x-axis is and what the scale is of the x-axis. So we can see the overall shape is like a bell-shaped curve. It's a normal distribution, but the fact that the x-axis is logged means it's a log normal distribution. Um, how would it look without a logarithmic scale? So if you had uh, this x-axis spread out uh, on a numeric scale, it would be pushing all these numbers way over here. So it's gonna sort of skew out if you did that. Um, the x the y-axis, just species richness. How many species had this much cover? So here we can see a lot of species had 0.5% cover and very few species, you know, only one species had 64 as a cover value. And uh, so it's really, you should be able to explain what this graph is showing you. How would I go ahead and try to draw one of these log normal distributions? So across my x-axis, we've got some sort of measure of the abundance of the species. So we've got some sort of measure down here of abundance. If it's an animal species, it could be the population size. If it's a plant species, it could be the number of trees density, could be the area of the trees, the biomass. And then up the y-axis, I have how many species 
have that abundance. And remember, on the x-axis, the abundance is going to be log base 2 abundance. So we're going to go, um, if we're going across this axis from one tick to the next, it's going to be double the number. So if I was talking about uh, abundance of species of mammals, I, I could start with like 20, 40, 80, 160. So each spot is going to be double the number. And there might be some mammals uh, maybe a couple of species that are very low in abundance. And a couple of species that are very high in abundance, you know, are squirrels um, and our, our rabbits and our, our uh, uh, house mice and stuff. And then, but most of the species uh, that... Um, are found are going to be sort of intermediate in abundance. So there's some there's some hawks and, and owls and or I guess I was talking about mammals. But uh, so so we're going to find a, some intermediate amount of abundance that have lots of species with that intermediate amount, but very few are going to be dominating. So you end up with this bell shaped curve. And obviously, it's going to be really hard to find the rare species. These ones down here are going to be difficult to find. And we see more of these. So these ones are easy to find. And the further we go down this scale, it is harder and harder to find these rarer species, the species that have uh, less abundant population sizes. So on the left is the first graph I showed you. This was Whitaker's data from desert plants. And uh, so we can see very few species were represented by um, more than 8% cover. So there's, there's uh, very few uh, at the tail end of things. And uh, very few species were down at less than 0.15% uh, cover. And then the um, uh, most species are in this intermediate area. Uh, and so uh, we have that very clear bell-shaped or normal distribution, the log normal distribution because of the log scale. The data on the right-hand side shows bird species. These were 86 species of birds. So we have 86 bird species. On this side, and it's the number of individuals uh, that they found in their, their breeding birds survey. And we can see that uh, they found very few uh, bird species with small uh, populations. So, so there's like uh, six or seven species here that had uh, on average one to two birds that they found. And there's like uh, one and two species down here that had hundreds of birds that they were found. But here we've got like 16, 17 species and 14 species. In these intermediate categories, you had uh, a lot of different birds. So uh, uh, you can see whether we were talking about the desert plants. On the left side, these were desert plants or we're talking about birds, we, we can still see basically the same pattern. When you're looking at the Preston's uh, distributions, it you often are missing on the, uh, the left-hand side of the graph, the log normal distribution, where you're trying to find uh, species that have very few individuals uh, they're much more difficult to find. And often you see these kind of truncated curves where you're, where you're kind of missing the other half of the bell shape. And uh, this is a, a really, we're looking at a sampling issue here. So uh, on the top graph, we have uh, a portion of a bell shaped curve. Um, and uh, this was, uh, this data was uh, looking at 
um, samples from uh, of moths from the Canadian prairies in Alberta and Saskatchewan in both of these. And uh, the top graph had 87,000 moths that they were looking at. And the bottom graph had 300,000 moths. And uh, so the... Uh, the bottom one was from Lethbridge, and it's got a much more complete curve than the than the top one from Saskatchewan. And uh, the top one had, you know, 87,000 individuals um, and 277 species. But the fact that when we got the bottom graph of 300,000 individuals, you ended up with more species. So uh, we have 291 species here versus 277 species here and when you get more species we're catching more of the rare ones so so we're really uh, starting to see that left part of the curve it's still not complete but the more you sample the community the more species you'll find um, and and the common species are going to be everywhere it doesn't matter whether you have lots of samples or not so many samples but uh, you need a lot of samples in order to capture the rare species. So um, through lots of, of work looking at a lot of different communities, the log normal distribution uh, does work in a lot of cases um, and uh, does seem to be something that we find quite a bit of when we are uh, analyzing these plots in nature. When you're looking at the log normal distribution, you may sort of wonder, why is it happening? Why do we see this kind of statistical uh, relationship? And uh, Robert May proposed that the log normal distribution is statistically um, uh, ex expected because it is more difficult to find uh, some species that you're going to uh, find this as a sampling uh, effect. Uh, Suga Harris said that the log normal distribution is a consequence of uh, the way the species partition the habitat and that it is based on um, uh, biotic interaction as opposed to uh, statistical expectation. And so there's different different views on the, the uh, functioning behind this curve or the reasoning behind this curve, why it happens in nature. We've looked at the log normal distribution of species abundance. Uh, the next lecture, we're going to move on to talk about species diversity. Uh, if you're working through this chapter in the textbook, um, we're also going to be talking, uh, looking in class at the Investigating the Evidence, number 23, about uh, how you find peer-reviewed literature which is uh, sort of an important step in studying ecology. Uh, for this uh, section of the chapter 6.1, you should be able to answer the first two uh, concept review questions, which is why do smaller samples result in only part of the bell-shaped curve that's characteristic of the log normal distribution? And why did the mass massive sampling efforts associated with the moth collections um, reveal uh, only a portion of the log normal distribution while studies in birds and plants produce nearly complete log normal distributions. So uh, you should be able to answer those questions. And then there's also uh, chapter review questions at the end about this as well. So uh, we will see you in our next lecture uh, talking about species diversity.